Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you. This week on New Mexico in Focus, using forensic anthropology to help with the crisis around missing and murdered Native American women. The pool of comparison of known individuals of Native American descent is very, very small. Plus, the latest on COVID restrictions and plans to roll out vaccinations. New Mexico in Focus starts now. Thanks for joining us this week. I'm your host, Gene Grant. We're finally starting to see COVID-19 numbers ease, but as good as it might be to get to the end of 2020, we're not out of the woods yet. The line weighs in. Our opinion panel also tackles the problems with rural broadband and New Mexico's victory at the Supreme Court in a water battle with Texas. We'll also give you an update on the mysterious bird die-off from September. Here's the line. New Mexico saw its first COVID-19 vaccinations arrive this week. Doctors, nurses, and hospital staff who have been fighting the disease for 270 days or more will be the first to get the shots. There are still concerns that some people won't get vaccinated and concerns over case counts as the holiday break approaches. Our line opinion panel starts with that discussion. Joining us is the founder and president of Vox Optima Public Relations. That would be Merritt Allen. And we have a few of our line regulars, including attorney Laura Sanchez. She's with us. Former state Senator Dee Dee Feldman joins us, and UNM law professor Serge Martinez as well. And Serge, i stay with you here. Take first whack at this. I'm curious if the presence or promise of a vaccine will change people's behavior for the worse. And what does worse actually mean? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a real concern. I've been mm -hmm. thinking, you know, when you, it's easy to start coasting when you see the finish line in sight and people thinking, oh yeah, we're almost through this. And now the, you know, the, the urgency, the need to really be diligent is, is lessened. And I mean, I think it, it should be the opposite, right? My uh, coaches taught me to sprint through the finish line. Right. And I, I think that's what we should be doing here. Uh, say, look, we can handle this for a little bit longer because the, you know, we're getting close. But I suspect that there'll be a lot of people saying, good, 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 and just a sigh of relief. And you know, nine months of fatigue um, adding up and the holidays and the natural desire and tendency to want to get together. Mm -hmm. I mean, it doesn't seem like it's shaping up for the best, um, the best wrap up to this, to, to where we are. And you know, I think we will probably see it get worse before it does get better, unfortunately. Yeah. Merritt, follow up on that if you would. What's, what's behind, do you think, some people's reluctance to get a vaccine? What, what's going on out there? Well, uh, and actually, I, I'm kind of pleased to see that the numbers nationally of uh, people who are willing uh, to take the COVID vaccine are going up. Mm -hmm. uh, this week, the numbers are over just over 70%. And I think, I think that's very heartening. Um, and, you know, I, I come from the generation Let me, that- Let me interrupt for a sec, just to put a, a bow on that. It, the estimates are that we need 80% take rate to have immunity. So we're not that far off when you say 70%. Exactly. And and I feel like it kind of comes with um, Generation uh, X might be uh, the, uh, the the turning point here because we were the generation where school vaccines became mandatory. That was right. in seven. And so we got all the shots. And so we're the people who did not get measles or mumps. Uh, we grew up without this. Um, I'm a big fan of that. Uh, I started, but we're also the generation who became, um, I think, vaccine skeptic. Um, I got a little iffy on flu shots in the 90s. Those were the beginning of my childbearing years. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about the Marisol, which con uh, contains mercury. And um, like a lot of uh, women my age, uh, we became concerned because autism spiked. Right. And so those links uh, concerned us uh, a great deal. Of course, I just learned to shop around and only get two shots, didn't have the Marisol. The Marisol is not used as a preservative anymore. The current COVID vaccine, uh, of course, has uh, no mercury uh, compounds in it. What also I think people are concerned about is um, a live virus. And none of the vaccines um, currently in testing have any sort of live virus in it. Mm -hmm. They're all uh, based on uh, working on the body's response to build proteins that l lie in wait so that should they react, should this specific virus be introduced to the body, that uh, uh, 
you then build the T cells and other uh, response uh, mechanisms necessary to fight the virus. Mm -hmm. So there's no, there's no live virus in it. And I think those are the things that um, uh, some people have concerns about. Uh, there are also just, uh, th there's been a lot of misinformation out about uh, s simply just conspiracy theories. Right, exactly. The who think that if you have the virus, uh, you have you have immunity? We're not sure about that yet. That's right, that's and, right. and uh, uh, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. So let me let me uh, let me, let me uh, kind of get Didi mixed in here. Sorry, Mary, I want to kind of make a couple oh, more okay. swings, a couple more subjects here. Uh, Didi, in in the context of our new, well, sort of new green, yellow, red system, all of our counties are now currently red from Wednesday's update. Um, that said, underlying numbers are headed actually in the right direction for most of the state. So I'm, I'm curious how the system feels it's in your gut. Is, is it working? Are, are people informed? Are businesses able to make plans? What's your sense of it so far? I'm not sure whether it's the result of the new system that the um, cases are beginning, and it's very slight, just beginning to level off. Mm -hmm. And the hospitalizations are not at crisis level. I mean, we were actually at the worst crisis level where people were uh, in hospitals were having to begin to make decisions, life and death decisions, minute by minute decisions on who gets treatment and who doesn't because our our uh, ICUs and our um, our full, uh, we don't have the personnel mm -hmm. that we need and, um, you know, we, I, I feel that we are still uh, uh, tottering on the brink here. I'm, I'm not sure. And our entire state is in red. Um, there have been a few concessions that the governor has made so that more people can go Christmas shopping. But I am still waiting for the barrage of public information announcements, the campaign that says, stay home. Mm -hmm. We can celebrate Christmas differently this year. Um, and by the way, hope is on the way. Uh, we have the shot. And here is Mike Pence taking one. Uh, and I understand he is scheduled to have one tomorrow. Okay. But we need, you know, we need some public officials here in New Mexico. We need some from Chavez County, where the rate is so high. Uh, taking a uh, taking a shot uh, and encouraging people to do so mm -hmm. because um, this isn't a silver bullet, but it's the best we've got. Good point there. And as a reminder, I'm glad you brought it up. Uh, the week before Thanksgiving, it was that close to Thanksgiving before the government, the government, before our officials here, state officials started saying, you know, stay home, don't do this, don't do that. You'd think that'd be a little more active by now. It's interesting. Um, Laura Sanchez, interesting point here. The governor changed her public health order earlier this week to relax occupancy, as you know, uh, restrictions for large retail businesses. And Republicans jumped all over, just absolutely jumped all over it, accusing her of flip-flopping. Is that a fair criticism or is she just sort of following the numbers and adjusting as it's going along? Well, you know, I think it's an unfair criticism, mm -hmm. um, first and foremost, because uh, if you look at anybody who has had to stand in line in the bitter cold, and um, I worry most about people who have children, the elderly, anybody who has a, um, a health, a serious health issue, um, I have a special needs sister who mm -hmm. I have to take to the store from time to time. I have to pick up her medication and she prefers to go to Walmart. If you stand in line in front of a Walmart, um, you know, and these are big box stores and by and large, you're not talking about people who tend to go to Whole Foods. Right. To buy food. These are folks who are, have very limited options on where they can go. And so they're having to stand out there in the bitter cold with the wind whipping at them and and, and many of them are just not adequately dressed to be in that kind of cold and wait for an hour. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, you know, those are constituents for all of those folks that are criticizing her. And I think it was the right move to relax those standards um, to a point. I mean, we're not talking about reopening things completely, but it, it does make a big difference to not have to stand in line out there. Now, the flip side of that, and I was just at the store this week, so I, I actually experienced this. The flip side is that the lines at the at the checkout were were longer, right? <laughs> because I think that the stores hadn't really adjusted for 
um, those, you know, pe more people inside and therefore lines um, kind of going a little bit longer. So they didn't have the staffing yet. But I think that will adjust. And I think it's the right move in a state where we're really dealing with some very, very cold uh, weather at this point and people who don't necessarily dress for that. Right. I mean, compared to other states where you, you routinely have this kind of weather and folks are always going to be ha have their big and everything here you can go have a very wide swing in temperatures. And so people are often caught with very, you know, very light clothing, not very many layers when they're at the store and waiting in line. So it's really a, a public health issue. I mean, there was even a story about uh, this week about uh, Moriarty, people were asking uh, volunteers to come and stand in line at the Walmart. Oh, I hadn't heard that, huh. Yeah, but these rural areas have very limited uh, uh, options. So the Walmart's the only mm. place in town for some of these smaller places. And in Edgewood and Moriarty and places that get really, really bitter cold um, in the you know, East Mountains area, you really, you can't have people standing out in the cold for an hour to try to get in. So they were asking for volunteers to show up and, and hold a place in line. That's just unreasonable, I think. Mm -hmm. um, there's gotta be a better way. So I think those who are criticizing should probably take time to figure out how to solve some of these issues rather than spend their time criticizing to try to gain political points. Meredith, just under a minute here, I'd love, love to get your take on this. What's the Republican plan? I mean, if they don't like the way the governor's doing it, what's the Republicans' plan? Well, I, I think um, this last lockdown has been uh, too swift and too harsh. Uh, I, 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 and I, I think having people stand for an hour in the cold, I think shutting the only grocery store in uh, small towns in the South has been too harsh. Uh, it's been too much. Absolutely, there needs to be a plan. I think for uh, for public health reasons and to be to embrace uh, modern science and health, uh, Republican leadership needs to embrace the vaccine. Um, I think Republican leaders need to um, um, have photo ops taking the vaccine, mm. put out facts on the vaccine. Um, I think more than anything. Uh, a talking point can be if you hate standing in line for stores, if you want to get back into restaurants, take the vaccine. That's right. That is that is our one proven way out of this. You know what? I think all roads are going to lead right there. You watch. Now, we'll leave it there for now. Plenty more COVID news to come as we head into the new year. After the break, a unique approach to helping with the missing and murdered indigenous women crisis. We're across the state. We had a lot. We have reports of large numbers of mortalities of of, of migrant birds passing through the state. Um, birds that were showing up dead on the ground. Birds that were just on the ground in poor condition and disoriented. In an average year, nearly 6,000 Indigenous women and girls are reported missing or murdered in this country. Many are never identified. In part, that's because medical experts are dealing with a database that's decades and in some cases more than a century old. This week, Gwyneth Dolan talks to a UNM professor who has been working with native tribes and experts to find a respectful, high-tech solution. Professor Edgar, thank you so much for being with us today. It's my pleasure, thanks for having me. As a forensic anthropologist, part of your job is to look at human remains, and maybe that's just a skeleton, and try to answer the question, who was this person? Why has that been so difficult when it comes to uh, Native Americans? Um, well, the primary reason it's difficult for Native Americans is because it's difficult for everyone. It's no matter, no matter who you are, it's difficult. But uh, for Native American remains, um, there's a specific problem which has to do with a lack of comparative samples. What a forensic anthropologist really does is limit the pool of missing persons an unknown individual is compared to. So it's, all, it's rarely the forensic anthropologist's job to say that this set of bones was this person in life. That's not usually something we do. That happens with um, comparison of dental remains or comparison of x-rays or with DNA. But instead what the forensic anthropologist does with regard to identification is we help narrow the pool of missing persons for comparison. And so if you have, um, of course, if you have all the people in the world that are missing and we have one set of human remains that we wanna compare them 
to, it's difficult. There's not a, a giant database out there that allows that kind of comparison. Instead, we have to say, all right, well, is this person male or female? And that's gonna make the pool of comparison much smaller. Is the pool, or is this person 25 or 75? And that's gonna make the pool different. And to make that, to, to make that comparison, to say, is it male or female, or to see how old it is, what we basically do is use a bunch of statistics to compare our one unknown person to a bunch of known people. And so we know what males and females look like in their skeleton. And we know what 25 year olds and 75 year olds look like in their skeleton. The pool of comparison of known individuals of Native American descent is very, very small. And, and why is that? Why is this pool so small? It, it, you know, they're, they're not a, a terribly small percentage of the population. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of really good reasons why the Native American pool is very small. And most of it has to do with the fact that the measurements, the known people we have, come from documented skeletal collections. And so these are people who, upon their death, have donated their remains to museums. And that opens up such a ball of uh, problems, you know, such a twist for Native Americans who are in general, much more interested in removing their remains, their ancestors' remains from museums than adding their remains. There's, so there's very, very good reasons why Native Americans uh, on average would be untrustworthy of science. They have been abused by science, so why should they trust us? Um, they, we have taken their remains and not let them go despite requests. So there's very many good reasons why Native Americans would not want to donate to their museums. To, to museums, but there's this unintended consequence, which is that it's very difficult to have known comparisons. You know, I, there's a database that I read about that folks like you use to uh, make these comparisons. Mm -hmm. um, and apparently most of the Native American remains in this database are from the 1800s, is that right? That is right. So uh, that's because that's what's in museums. So the so for example, if you look at the the it's called the forensic data bank, and uh, the program, the statistical program that we use for comparison is called Fordisk, and it draws on what's in the forensic data bank. And so the forensic data bank has over a thousand people of European, primarily of European descent, white folks and hundreds and hundreds of African-Americans and even you know, a couple of hundred uh, Hispanic people. And it's also got Chinese people and it's got Vietnamese people. Um, they, the entire sample of Native Americans in that, in that data bank is about 90, but um, 75 of those are from the 19th century. So now they're known individual. I mean- Go ahead. So they're, they're old records, but I mean, humans are humans. What's the difference? Well, if humans were humans, then none of this comparison would work. If there was no pattern differences among skeletons, then this would be beside the point. Um, but there are differences and they change over time. Humans change over time. Um, so our, the goal of the research that we're taking up is twofold. It's one to figure out if a skeleton that we have is Native American or not. But a second part we have is to figure out if how tall they were, for example. And one thing that's clear is that all Americans are taller today than they were in the 1800s on average. But we don't really know how much that's true for Native Americans. And we don't know if proportions are the same. So there's something called secular change. And that's like change that happens in the average of human bodies, um, but is not necessarily genetic. And that's, you know, nutritional, and it has to do with the presence of antibiotics and different behavioral kinds of things. And so, you know, maybe, maybe those 18th century, uh, excuse me, 19th century skulls are representative of contemporary Native Americans, but I don't know, because I don't have any contemporary Native Americans or I haven't had contemporary Native Americans to compare. So we have this problem um, that is particularly dire. We have thousands, uh, as many as 6,000 a year, missing and murdered indigenous women. Mm -hmm. And we have a problem with this database being, you know, basically unable to help in that effort. 
What has UNM done that is special to contribute to this solution here? So UNM is most definitely at the forefront of improving this situation. And it grows out of a much larger project called the New Mexico Decedent Image Database. Um, and it's a confluence of events that, uh, and, uh, and a lot of foresight on uh, various people's parts that allows this to happen. So uh, a little history starts with uh, 2010 when the Office of the Medical Investigator moved into a brand new building. Um, now, New Mexico is really unique in that we have one statewide office as our medical uh, uh, investigator system and it's based in a university. So it has a research component to it that not all medical examiners do. Um, the old facility was old and old and old. And then <laughs> we moved into the new facility. They moved into the facility. I wasn't part of it yet. Uh, and the folks there in charge had the foresight to predict that um, advanced imaging could be an important component in um, the forensic investigation of death. And in 2010, this was pretty cutting edge. There were not many medical investigators or examiners around the country or around the world who used uh, computed tomography or CT in their work. So when they built the new building, they put in a CT scanner and they put in an MRI imaging machine. So those are two capabilities that are actually still not common around the country or around the world. Most people do not have access to that. And so the Office of the Medical Investigator here uses CAT scans and MRIs on almost every individual that comes through the office. Is that right? That's right. And what, one of the benefits is that um, it means that more, more individuals can be a, a, a thorough death investigation can happen with that image and an external exam and fewer individuals need full autopsy. And especially for some communities, including the Native American community, that's a really big deal. Yeah, not having to do that. That's right. So what kind of information are you gathering for this database from these CAT scans and MRIs? So the MRIs are actually not in this database. They end up being kind of specialized. We, and besides we have enough, the CAT scans are enough. So the database that we're drawing on, uh, this New Mexico De De Decedent Image Database or N NMDID, um, covers the span from 2010 to the 2017, and it includes everybody who had a CT scan that passed through that office. And it comes out to be about 15,243 individuals. It's amazing. It actually represents 11% of the people who died in New Mexico during that time period. Um, so, that, so the kind of research that can come from that is really... Uh, not just about missing and murdered indigenous women, but many, many, many other things. This is just one project. Um, and we have made this data, uh, we've, we've de-identified it and we've made it available to the research public. So you took all the personal information, there's no names attached. There's no names, there's no birth dates, there's not even a zip code past three digits. Um, so any piece of information that could be used to identify these people has been removed or is covered in the data use agreement that a researcher has to sign. So there's lots and lots of research coming out of this, not just one thing. What are some of the, the things that people are using this database for? So uh, there's a person looking at uh, sarcoidosis, which is a disease that can sometimes, I didn't even know this, but it can result from cancer treatment. And so they're looking at that. Uh, there are people who are looking at um, uh, I just got a request today for somebody who wants to look at variation in the shape of the cheekbone so that they can better make implants for people who have broken cheekbones and, uh, ha and need reconstructive surgery. There's uh, people who are looking at the evolution of bipedalism. There's people who are looking at, um, well, there's actually a couple of researchers that are using scans of people who died of pneumonia to compare to scans of people who are dying of COVID today. Um, so there's a, that's just a touch. There's people looking at improving automobile safety. Um, uh, and so there's about a hundred different researchers right now already drawing on this resource. 
So you have these CAT scans and then you have all of this other information. How did you get the other information about these people? Yeah, it's the other information that makes this super valuable. That's really the most important part. So the information comes from two different sources. One is the medical legal investigation of the death. So that includes the autopsy, if there is one, but it also includes the death investigator, who's the person that leaves the office and goes out to a scene, you know, and asks family members questions and all those kinds of things. All that's in there. And then we also had uh, a cadre of students calling the next of kin of decedents and asking them a survey of questions. And of course, no one was obligated to, um, to answer these questions and they could answer some questions and not all questions. But um, what was really amazing to me is how many people were really pleased to contribute this information because they had an understanding that their family member's death with this information could help people in the future. That is amazing. So mm -hmm. you did a pilot study and you have about 250 records that you know specifically relate to Native American individuals. We have, I was gonna say, we, we actually have about 1800 people in the database who are Native American. For a little more than 250, we know their tribal affiliation. And that's, that's a hard detail to pin down from a skeleton, isn't it? I, I would never get it from the skeleton. That's not something you get from the skeleton. That's something you get from the investigative report or from the next of kin. But that can be really valuable in narrowing the field of someone you're looking for. Is that right? Possibly. We don't really know yet how much variation there is among groups. Um, we, I don't know how different they are, um, but this is how we're going to find that out. So what do you think the impact will be? You know, um, I, there are a thousand people in the database, the thousand Anglo people in the database you mentioned earlier, this very small number of mostly old um, mm -hmm. records of Native American people. You've got all of these really detailed records to add to that pile, what's the potential impact? So here's what I'm really hoping for and why I'm doing this project. My hope is that we can shorten the time that an unknown person is missing. So, you know, when someone goes missing, whether they are murdered or not, there's a time that's very stressful for a family. And in fact, I've been through this so I can relate there's a time that, that you don't know what happened to your family member. And when skeletal remains are found, if we either can't identify this person as Native American or misidentify them as Hispanic or, or, or white or whatever, if we misidentify them, it's going to make it more challenging to match them with the correct missing persons report and then attempt to identify them. So that's what I hope is the real and practical value of this, is that we will, uh, and I believe it will happen, that we will shorten the time that families don't know what happened to their family member. Professor Edgar, thank you so much for talking to us today. It was my pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. New Mexico is sort of an internet desert, a high desert, but a desert nonetheless. Solving the rural broadband problem and bringing higher speeds to cities is a big deal. And so far, it's the unsolvable riddle for New Mexico political leaders. You think about this all the years. They all pay lip service to the problem, but the pandemic has laid bare its impact. Uh, last, Mar last March, as the state pivoted to an online learning scheme, a fifth of students didn't have broadband. Now, Laura, the plaintiffs in the Yazzie Martinez lawsuit say the state hasn't done enough to help the vulnerable groups at the center of that suit get broadband effectively. Their motion said denying them not just equal education, but an education period. What's your reaction to that? I think they have a point. I think mm -hmm. it's an important point that they've raised. Um, you know, this is a lawsuit just by review that was filed uh, quite, quite a few years ago now, but it was resolved um, in 2018. There was a decision um, and that was right at the very end of the Martinez mm -hmm. administration, um, right before the election, the general election. Um, where Michelle Lujan Grisham came in, but 
basically the decision was that that the state had an obligation to provide um, a fair, fully funded education for um, vulnerable populations, which included tribal members, um, uh, racial minorities, Hispanic um, folks, disadvantaged students, as well as students with special education needs. Um, and the state of the of education at that point was so so dire for some of these vulnerable populations that it was important that the state figure out how to um, essentially equalize their resources better for those targeted at those school uh, those school children and those particular school districts and areas that were most affected. Um, and so, but you know, fast forward to where we are now, I don't think anybody could have anticipated how important it would be to deliver. Um, to be able to have access to education through online means. Mm -hmm. We obviously at that point couldn't have anticipated that there was going to be this pandemic, that we were going to, going to be doing so much online. Um, and so a lot of these same students that were the plaintiffs or the subject of the of the plaintiffs in those in that case are once again falling through the cracks. They're once again falling behind dramatically from uh, where they should be. And I think that that's, that's what they're raising. And it's a very important red flag to raise and one that I do think that legislators are paying attention to um, because there's such a huge need in the rural areas for broadband. Mm -hmm. I know that Senator Michael Padilla, for example, has been a longtime advocate of trying to address this issue. He has been the chair of the Interim Committee on Science and Technology and has had many, many meetings um, with providers in rural areas, uh, internet service providers and other um, telecom companies and as well as the electric co-ops, some of which provide mm -hmm. um, uh, internet as well, to try to figure out how to expand rural access to rural broadband. And all of that is really going to be, I think, somewhat of an issue coming up in the session. There's definitely going to be some bills related to that. And I think it's something that the legislature needs to come together, mm -hmm. both with educators and with technology um, providers and figure out how to expand access. That's a good point to that last point. Hey, Serge, you think about it, we've had a court drive education policy, and now it looks like we're gonna have a court driving broadband policy uh, in our state. I mean, what is it, and Dede, Senator Fell, I want you to follow up on this one too. What's it say about our current and past governors, legislators, congressional people, representatives? Why did it have to come down to this, the court saying you must do this? Uh, I mean, I, I think that you've hit it right on the head. This is. This is, you know, as Lauren said, this is not an issue that is a surprise to anybody here, right? Mm -hmm. in, in the state, the broadband access, the access, the sufficiency of education issue. And the state, um, you know, even the current administration has been saying, trying to get out of Yazzie, trying to get the case dismissed, you know, dragging their feet, um, rather than embracing this head on and saying, this is, we're under court order to do this, but also this is the right thing to do for New Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for education, for the people of New Mexico, for the for the economic future of the state. And instead, it is just kicking and screaming that this is all happening. And you know, we're nine months into this pandemic, and and so many students have been lost, like literally, the school districts don't know where to find them. That's right. Yeah. This is a crisis that should be a five alarm fire, um, and. You know, if the state is wants to fight center on land poverty and the Yazi plaintiffs on on their motion and saying, no, they need to do more. Right. That's energy that needs to be spent in just addressing the problem. Mm hmm. Senator, your, your your sense of that, why this has to be a court driven situation and why folks our elected folks have not gotten their arms around this. Well, I think it's a failure of leadership, frankly, mm -hmm. uh, in the legislature, in the PRC, which also has, has a share this yep. and uh, in the governor's office. I mean, in 2005, the uh, legislature appropriated $50 million uh, to, to make sure that every school was connected to, uh, to broadband and using this thing called the E-rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, the utilities also bear a big uh, share in uh, in this problem because they haven't been willing to spend the money to go the la that last mile mm -hmm. to connect uh, connect folks in rural areas. So um, you know the legislature's been talking about it for years, and still there is no central uh, agency that handles all of this. Uh, there is no actual assessment of how much it would cost to actually install broadband to 100% of the areas in, in New Mexico. The thing about this suit, which I think is great, 
um, and, and needed um, is that, remember the judge said, uh, Sarah Singleton said, it doesn't matter how much it costs the state, you must do it mm -hmm. in order to provide equal education to New Mexico's children. Um, but in, in you know, that's fine, but as a legislator, you still have to come up with the money to, to do it. And uh, that, has, that has not been done. So it's embarrassing, uh, but there are short-term fixes. There are short-term fixes that can be um, more money so that, um, I mean, even if the broadband is there, uh, students don't, or families don't have the money to hook it, hook up, to pay right. the monthly fee. They don't have the laptops. They don't have, uh, the teachers don't have the training and the IT departments to deal with this. So there is a possibility, I think, of like a short-term fix to this, even if the long-term really expensive thing uh, is not possible. Mm -hmm. You know, Merritt, I'm looking at the uh, press release that came out of Tom Udall's office, New Mexico delegation, hails $165 million grant funding to expand rural broadband access. And there's a big hoop to do about all the money that's coming in, and a number of our rural cooperatives are getting a good chunk of change here. I mean, we're talking, you know, $2 million plus, $38 million for Continental Divide Electric, electric Cooperative, $26 million for NM Surf Inc. I mean, there's a lot of dough flying around here. Would it be reasonable for people to expect this to be solved now within a reasonable period of time? Because the argument has always been, there's just not enough money to do this. Could we just stop this now and just get this done? Well, um, and, and you kind of framed this beautifully because, uh, and also to um, Senator Feldman's point, um, who, is this just another big capital outlay? And we, who, who's going to see where this goes? Yep. Um, and uh, of course, I, uh, I have I have the ability to come into um, a flex space. I'm in uptown Albuquerque, uh, being able to use broadband. But of course, I'm I'm a teleworker, and I live in the East Mountains, and I really can't work function as a teleworker. And everyone's saying, well, the teleworkers they want to leave Silicon Valley, they want to leave New York City, they should come to New Mexico. They can't. That's right. We, we, we don't have the broadband. So this should be a huge multiplier, uh, starting with um, our children, starting with our children in rural areas, starting with our underserved children, uh, starting uh, with um, the populations identified in the Yazzie case. This should be a multiplier. I think it's going to take um, statewide uh, 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 teeth or mm -hmm. regulatory teeth. I think it's going to take the PRC. I think... Um, you know, the, uh, the the trunk line that um, uh, is so overpopulated that I feed off of at my house that CenturyLink is pretty open about, oh yeah, we should never ha allow the people that we have feeding off of your DSL line. Right. Well, why don't we lay more line? Mm -hmm. Well, no one's giving us money to do it. Oh, okay, but you, you're, you are willing to charge us all $150 a month for um, 1995 level uh, access fees. I, I want to talk, it's, it's going to take some individual innovation and outside of this press release, outside of the Senate effort, um, the, sac the sacred wind effort in Sierra County, that was came out in October, that's $6.1 million to the USDA. That's going to be, uh, go to 1600 homes, it's going to be fiber optic, it's going to go to Sierra County, working with an electric rural cooperative. I have great hope for that because Sacred Wind has been doing cool stuff for over a decade. I don't know if you all are familiar with them. They're a tribal owned organization mm -hmm. and they've been doing really innovative stuff with USDA for over a decade. It started with power mm -hmm. and getting um, in a standalone power units to rural homes um, on reservations. Was that through the Rural Development Program? Am I remembering that correctly? It was, it was with USDA. It, it was, was USDA, USDA. okay. And it was a solar plant panel on a concrete block that also contained a um, uh, a generator that was powered by propane. If the propane ran out, there was a battery. So um, you could uh, uh, power a 2,000 square foot dwelling with solar with the uh, propane and battery backup. Gotcha. And it was in it was off grid. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah. something 
were doing 10 years ago. And so now they've taken on broadband because they saw a need and no one else would do it. That's a good point. So, Boy, you know, I, I would encourage folks to go to the release from Mr. Udall's office. There's some serious dough flowing into this state now for broadband. I'm looking at a number of companies. One of them, Resound Networks LLC, $59 million. It's a lot of money around these parts. SpaceX, $25 million, a lot of money. Let's get some broadband going. All right, up next, some answers to the bird die-off back in September. In September, thousands of birds passing through to Mexico died during their fall migration. While many had guesses as to what caused the die-off, it remained a bit of a mystery. Wildlife experts studied the reports and the carcasses to find that while there wasn't a single cause of death for all the birds, almost all of them were, quote, severely emaciated, end quote. The New Mexico Department of Game and Fish has yet to release those lab reports, which we've requested on your behalf. My colleague Laura Pascas talks with New Mexico State University's Dr. Martha Desmond about the event and what it might mean for the future. Dr. Martha Desmond, thanks for joining me again. Just as a refresher, can you remind us what happened earlier this year, the avian mortality event that we saw? Well, we saw an, it was an event in early September. It was the eighth, and the bulk of it was um, September eighth through tenth. Where across the state, we had a lot. We have reports of large numbers of mortalities of of, of migrant birds passing through the state. Um, birds that were showing up dead on the ground. Birds that were just on the ground in poor condition and disoriented. Birds that were exhibiting some very odd types of behaviors. And, um, and so across the state, we collected, I'm gonna guess probably a thousand carcasses of birds um, from this event, but basically just in a short period of time an unusually large number of mortalities. And so there's some new analysis out. What do we know about what happened? Well, what we know so far, and we still don't know the whole story, but um, not that surprising some of you know what we suspected and it seems that the, the vast majority of these birds are almost all these birds examined were in very poor health and they were in poor health when they entered New, New Mexico so these birds were starving and they were in various stages of starving and that strong weather event that um, came into the state intensified that situation and that's what really resulted in some of these birds um, dying, probably many of these birds may have been, um, were on the, were on their path to dying anyway, but yeah. So there were lots of different species and I'm guessing they would have been coming from different places, but you know, um, where were they not finding food? What, what would have, you know, well, where you know, did this all start? Yeah, that's really hard. And so we don't know what has what precipitated this. And so it could, you know, we've been in a, a fairly significant drought situation in the Southwest. And so for these species, um, we had both insectivores and granivores. And so these drought conditions will affect seed production for those birds that depend on seed. It also obviously affects insect production for the birds that are insectivores. And the, the majority of them, I'm gonna say probably 70% of the birds um, were insectivores across the state and was a little um, down in the south we had a higher percentage of granivores as well that but anyway the, ma the majority of them were insectivores um, we don't know it could be that some of these birds started migration before they were ready to migrate it could be that the fires in the west caused them to leave early um, it may have changed their migratory pathway and so one of the things we saw were some, like here in Las Cruces, we saw a large number of Western wood peewees. And these are birds that fly over our area, but that species in particular isn't a common species to, to see on the ground here in Southern New Mexico. But for whatever conditions contributed, that bird was one of our most common migrants when this event happened. And there were a large number of mortalities for that species. So is this something that, were worried or scientists are worried could happen next year or the year after? Absolutely. And so one of the things um, we want to be able to do is to start to look at what are the conditions that led to this and be able to predict these in the future. Um, certainly it's not something we can prevent, but we can kind of predict when they are going to occur and maybe also think about what species are most vulnerable 
to these types of events so that um, there may be some actions that we can take to um, on breeding grounds or wintering grounds for those particular species. So we have requested the lab reports from the New Mexico Department of Game and Fish. We haven't been able to see those reports yet. We we're hoping to find out a little bit more um, about sort of what happened and, and what to be looking for. Have you seen those reports as well? I have, but just very briefly, I just got them. And today, you know, I, I just haven't had time to really sit down and look them over. I've looked at like at the first page of some of them, but basically what it looks like from the set of birds that were sent to that lab is that most of the starv starvation was the major cause um, and that it wasn't and these birds were wasting their flight muscles. They were, you know, they were using up whatever energy they had stored in their body um, to survive. And so this was not a short-term starvation. This was a longer-term starvation. And as the report said that, um, oh, that, so department biologists know that migrating birds entered New Mexico in poor body condition, and some birds were already succumbing to starvation. The unusual winter storm exasperated conditions, um, likely causing birds to become disoriented and fly into objects and buildings. So what happens when birds, sometimes birds, um, when you're, they're migrating and you have um, cloudy conditions and stormy conditions, they're flying a lot of times at lower altitudes than they normally fly and they get attracted to lights and they'll start circling around those lights and then they'll um, fly into buildings. And that's something that um, does commonly occur during migration and especially during poor weather and probably these birds that are in poor body condition are more susceptible to that. I was wondering, because for the birds that did survive, um, presumably not all of them died when they were trying to migrate. Mm -hmm. For those that did survive, does that put them at higher risk for mortality throughout the year or poor breeding for the spring? Sure. Well, you know, if they're in poor body condition, and we did, um, we did look at some of the live birds as they were moving through and assess their body condition. And they weren't, you know, they didn't have, the, most of them had no fat on them whatsoever. I will caution that when a bird is migrating, when they stop at a location, the reason they're stopping and feed is because they need to feed and they need to put on fat stores. So it's not necessarily unusual that they don't have fat stores on, but all of the birds were, um, were very um, thin and emaciated, didn't have a lot of fat. So that might be surprising. Um, and if a bird is in poor health, then yes, it is more vulnerable um, just like a human to um, acquiring a disease con or contracting a disease. So, yeah. So that's some, one thing that hopefully in the future we'll be able to pull some funding together to look at. All right. Well, Dr. Desmond, thank you so much for joining me. You're most welcome. Thank you. New Mexico notched a win in the water war with Texas this past week. The Supreme Court said the state should get credit for water that evaporated in New Mexico after Texas asked our state to hold that water to prevent flooding. Texas argued it was still owed some 21,000 acre feet. Interesting decision there. Serge, why is this a significant decision in your opinion? Uh, well, I mean, this, this is, I think, an interesting opinion. Um, it may not have a lot of uh, precedential value or significance going down the road for mm -hmm. a few reasons. Um, one of my colleague, Reed Benson, is an expert in these matters, and he has a really interesting piece on this on the Supreme Court blog, SCOTUS blog that he writes for. But, you know, basically, this was a dispute between New Mexico and Texas about whether the river master, who had been appointed, you know, many years ago, um, could resolve a dispute about what happened when New Mexico was storing water for Texas that, at Texas's request, that evaporated between, you know, the time of that request and the time of delivery. And when the river master made a determination that Texas didn't like, um, they took this case, you know, up to the Supreme Court, which mm -hmm. the reason it was at the Supreme Court is because that's where you go when one state sues another. And I think it was interesting that, you know, this is twice in one week, that a te Texas was on the wrong end of a decision by the Supreme Court when it was suing other states. <laughs> You know, you know, these things don't happen all that often. Um, but in terms of, you know, what this means going down the road, you know, there's only two 
two river masters in the country, uh, we, and we have one. Right. Uh, but it does probably mean that Texas and New Mexico will be, have more incentive to try to work, work future disputes, and I'm sure there are many more coming, mm-hmm. out amongst themselves, between, between each other, right, rather than go up to the Supreme Court, which clearly didn't want to have anything to do with the, uh, the underlying you know, matter. Mm-hmm. Senator, you know, interestingly, when I, when I consider this, thinking about it last night, I mean, Texas asked us to hold the water. We held the water. And then they claimed we didn't deliver. <laughs> I mean, you could call it cheeky. I, I think there's another word there. I mean, this ask is really kind of interesting to me. I, I'm just, were you surprised? Or, or, and are you surprised at the decision? Well, I'm, I'm always glad when New Mexico wins over Texas. Good point. <laughs> and uh, we've had water disputes and cases uh, with Texas before in El Paso, for example, in 1979, and we lost, and El- and Texas won. The the conventional wisdom is that Texas is always going to outlawyer us, throw more money at us, uh, at the case, and really, I mean, the, it's the Rio Grande that is the big Kahuna That's here, right. or maybe the big. Um, big trout, big brown trout, um, because uh, these are interstate compacts. And the Rio Grande Compact has been strained by drought and climate change. Mm -hmm. And the obligations that New Mexico has to Texas uh, are, um, are hard to meet in those conditions. And so there are some that say uh, that the Rio Grande Compact really needs to be renegotiated all together uh, so that Colorado, New Mexico, and Texas have a more realistic share of a limited water supply. And um, that's not going to happen anytime soon. Uh, So meanwhile, uh, New Mexico is under the gun from Texas, especially on the Rio Grande. Mm -hmm. Uh, Merritt, this water, this decision was for the Pecos River, but as Didi just mentioned, the Rio Grande is a whole other kettle of fish here. When you think about the still pending suit about groundwater pumping for farmers south of Elephant Butte on the Rio Grande, there's a lot here that needs to be parsed out. And I'm, I'm curious what you guys think about how Senator Feldman just set this up. In a time of drought and everything else, do we have a chance to revisit any of this and really fight this out in a fair way? I guess what really struck me about um, the, the case uh, that was just um, adjudicated Mm -hmm. was the key element texas had just been inundated by a tropical storm right (laughs) you know texas has been flooding so that's why we were asked to store the water so Mm -hmm. i also try to imagine the supreme court and just what kind of um you know a docket they've had this year i mean just so much drama so much national attention so I, i could kind of see them reviewing okay Tropical storm, flooding, you've had a ton of tropical storms this year. Um, New Mexico, um, the West is on fire, water evaporated. Okay, you guys are just being jerks. Boom, two sentence ruling, we're done. Mm-hmm. Um, do, I, I mean, you've got, people, yeah, you've, got, you've got two lawyers and um, a retired state senator who has dealt with um, water law adjudication. And what I bring to the table is, you know, I'm two thirds water and I drink it. So uh, <laughs> what what uh, Southern New Mexico groundwater, whether that will be revisited. Typically, the Supreme Court doesn't go back to previous rulings. Um, so mm-hmm. uh, uh, previous decisions. No, I do know that what will happen with the groundwater. Um, does this lay precedent? Um, yes. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, will, it will it will add uh, it, it will add to the case. So um, I think uh, and this has been a hopeful show. You know, we've got the broadband funding. Mm. Uh, we, we've got a vaccine. So I'm I'm going to, as someone who is composed of and drinks water, say, yeah, I feel good about it. There you go. <laughs> hey, Laura, let me re- read you. Um, Justice Brett Kavanaugh delivered the opinion for the court, stating, quote, this question presented is straightforward. Under the Pecos River Compact, does New Mexico receive delivery credit for the evaporated water, even though that water was not delivered to Texas? The answer is yes. Pretty, you know, anything to parse there? Do you hear anything, any hints of anything else? It seems very straightforward. 
It is very straightforward. And um, I never thought that I would agree with uh, Brett Kavanaugh on anything, but um, I thought he got it correct. Um, And I think the Supreme Court got it right. Of course, uh, people in Texas might disagree about that. Um, You know, I'm a member of the Natural Resources, Energy and Environment Law section for our state bar. And we have um, obviously a number of water lawyers, um, amazing and and very successful water lawyers that are a part of that section. So I'm always careful to not wade into their space (laughs) because I do energy stuff. Mm -hmm. But I will say that, you know, in New Mexico, as I think in the West in general, water is like oil, right? I mean, it's it's actually much more valuable to the West than than a lot of, uh, you know, the oil reserves that we have uh, for many reasons. And this is one where um, I think the basic science made sense. You know, how can you expect um, a state to deliver a certain number of acre feet when there's obvious um, evaporation happening? And that's really what had occurred. So it was a straightforward, I think, in my mind, a contractual issue. That, you know, New Mexico didn't cause those acre feet to evaporate. That was just sort of a, you know, part and parcel of the of the physics of the entire thing. Mm-hmm. So I think they got that right. What will be interesting, I think, is what. Didi brought up, which is the Rio Grande, uh, the Rio, Rio Grande uh, <laughs> River Compact issue. That one is interesting because it pits, um, well, first of all, Colorado and New Mexico yeah, against 15 Texas. seconds, sorry about that. Mm-hmm. But the issue has to do with the local um, Elephant Butte Irrigation District farmers who had been using some of that Rio Grande water for their, um, for their livelihood. Mm-hmm. And Texas then feels like New Mexico should have um, you know, given them more than what was taken out. So it's a very interesting local government kind of local impact issue. Mm-hmm. Hey, we're out of time. I want to thank our panelists for being here. To all the panelists, have a great holiday. Very safe, please. Be sure to catch up with us on Facebook. Just search New Mexico in focus. If you're of a certain vintage age wise, you can look at your left shoulder and likely still see that little round scar from that dreaded jet injector gun and receiving the measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine all at once. Ooh, that hurt, trust me. Or maybe that bifurcated needle shot for TB in the forearm, remember that? 15 pricks of the needle, that one. Oh, that was fun. How about valley fever? A dust-borne fungal infection common in California and Arizona, but more and more right here in New Mexico. Scientists are furiously working on a vaccine for both humans and dogs, and it'll be welcome news when it happens. At some point, it becomes clear that receiving vaccinations becomes part of the human body experience, like an ownership thing. A rite of passage sometimes, when you're a kid too. Plenty of us received the smallpox vaccine right through the early 70s, even though it was declared extinct in 1952. Military folks have been getting all these vaccines on the regular for years, and now it's our turn for the COVID-19 vaccine. Some are already saying no way, no how, and that's unfortunate, It's also a symptom of the times where trust is thin and the spirit of all for one and one for all is almost passe. Maybe over the holidays we can harken back to our minds, in our minds, to a time when we lined up in elementary school and trusted that that person holding that terrifying jet injector gun actually had our best interests in their hands. American science has come through in spectacular fashion for this vaccine. I'm ready. Just no jet injector gun this time, please. Thanks again for joining us, for staying informed and engaged. We'll see you again next week in Focus. Funding for New Mexico in Focus provided by the McCune Charitable Foundation and viewers like you.